establish in our hearts this morning and may it propel us into a life of victory. The science in the name that's above every name. Spread some love. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, guys. Well, praise the Lord. Blessed be the name of the God of heaven. Amen. I want to speak to you this morning. Uh, on great things. change everything you know about faith. Are you ready to change everything? Hallelujah. Amen. The Bible speaks of faith. The Bible says that we should have faith in God. The Bible tells us that without faith, we cannot please this God. The Bible tells us our walk with God is not by what we see, not by what we hear, but what we believe. So faith becomes the foundation of everything. Without faith, you cannot say that you trust God. Without faith, you could not take communion. Because if the Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, in order for you to come to God, you've got to believe that He is. And He is the giver of gifts to those that diligently seek Him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So this subject of faith should become a very important part of our life. Without faith, we cannot worship God. Without faith, we sit in here on a Sunday morning for nothing. Paul said, if Jesus did not die and raise again, the gospel is, is, is futile. It means nothing. We've got to have faith in this gospel. We've got to have faith that one day we're going to die in this flesh, but we're going to live again. Hallelujah. And yesterday I was in Cape Town uh, speaking to the pastors. And I made a joke to them, and I was telling them that um, we gotta we gotta move away from the traditions of all. And if you believe in this Jesus, you must believe in Jesus. You must lay aside the cultures of all. Amen. And I was just joking with them, and you know, many times we as Christians, our faith is not as solid as we think it is. Because faith must be based in your revelation of God. It must not be moved by where you come from and what's your culture and what's your belief system of your family. It must be based on the Bible. That is faith. That's what my Bible tells me. All those things have passed away. And I was making a joke with the, you know, I hope there's not uh, the Indian people I love all of them. But we are making a joke and um, there's a lot of, you know, sometimes there's a pastor in my family surrounded by Indian people. I am an Indian, by the way. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but I don't talk, I don't act like an Indian. I don't believe I'm an Indian because I believe I'm a son of God. Okay? Yeah. And uh, I, I get caught up with my family when there's funerals and things. Because then they want to drag me into all these cultural things, you know? And uh, they, they want us to cry the night before the funeral. They bring the body home, they cry the whole night. Then in the morning they'll cry again, and I must come and preach for them. And then they'll come to the church, they'll cry. These are Christians, by the way. Then they'll cry again in the church. I must come preach again for them. Then we go to the, to the, the cemetery, we'll cry again, and I must preach again. And then I must also hold back some of the aunties, I want to jump into the grave. <laughs> And, uh, but now the problem is what I find is that we must have faith in what our belief structure is. If you believe this Bible, if you have faith in Jesus, that means you believe this Bible. And this Bible says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. There's no need. It's a graduation ceremony. You know the Indian people, they haven't hired his own artists that will sit at the coffin. And then when someone walks in the house, Are you mom? And he's like crying. And then everyone starts crying. And then they'll stop for a moment. And then the next family walks into the place. And 
and his aunties will start crying again and they provoke her. I'm just messing with her. But these are the silly things that we do. And I get caught up with the family. In the young years in ministry, I allow them to pull me into these things. Now I will not allow me. Now I will tell them, I will meet you in the church. We're going to say our prayers in the church and then we're gone. Goodbye. I'm not going to be pulled in. But our faith must be solid in the things of God. Your faith, great faith. I want to talk to you about great faith. And I'm going to change your perspective on it. The Bible says in the book of Hebrew, when it talks of faith, from Hebrew chapter 4, by faith, Abraham offered good, a God, a more excellent sacrifice. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive an inheritance. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And by faith, they passed through the Red Sea. And by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. And what more shall I say? For the time would not would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of David and Samuel, of the prophets, Yeranunda, Karash, and Dede. It's about faith. It was through faith that all the great pages of this Bible was written. So I want to talk to you about this faith this morning. I want to talk to you about what it is to believe God. Amen. And so when we talk of great faith, there's two times in the Bible that um, they made mention of this great faith. And once was with the centurion, if we turn to the book of Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. And I'm going to read from verse 5. Where God, where the Bible mentions great faith. We all want great faith, amen? amen. We want to possess great things. That's how we, that's how we think, but I'm going to change that today. Now the Bible reads from verse 5 in the 8th chapter of Matthew. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man under authority and have soldiers under me. Remember this man was a man of authority. He was a man that led legions. And I said to this one, go, and he goes, and to the other, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed him, but surely I say to you, I have found, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you, that many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out in outer, outer darkness. They will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go your way. And as you have believed, so it will be done unto you. And so we learn here that Jesus mentioned great faith. Such faith, he said, this kind of faith was never seen in Israel. Among his disciples, among all those that, that dwelt around him. And this great faith was how much you believe God. And many times we have this perception when we speak of great faith. And, we, and we, we, we think that you're going to be a, a man and a woman that can pray, that can prophesy, that can worship, that can preach, 
and we put this picture on what great faith is all about. But these things of being the super spiritual person was among those that followed Jesus. They were the super spiritual people. They could prophesy, they could preach, they could sing, they could read the scriptures, they could quote 20 scriptures without reading the Bible. But yet they were not the ones that possessed great faith. It was a centurion that didn't even know the things of the church. So what is this great faith? So great faith has nothing to do with what you project to people to be spiritual. Great faith is what you have, your revelation of this God. That is great faith. So you can be the super uh, person in church, preaching and prophesying, but you may have little faith. I'm going to teach you about this. And that's what he said, the centurion came, he didn't know, he was not even with Jesus. He was not in church, he was not uh, prophesying, he was not worshipping, he was not preaching. But he told Jesus, I believe that you can just speak a word and it shall be done. Amen. And Jesus looked at that and he said, wow. I want to tell you something this morning, my brother and sister. Jesus is not looking for you to be super spiritual. Jesus is looking for you to believe this word as it is like a child. So great faith has nothing to do what you do, what people see. Great faith is what you believe in your heart. How you love your life. How you walk every day. That is great faith. Great faith is how you trust God when no one is looking. How you believe it without doubting one but when you walk. Great faith was when Peter stood off the boat and he said, Lord, call to me and I will come to you. It didn't matter what you did. It didn't matter what people saw you to be. And God said, Jesus told him, Jesus told the centurion, go your way as you have believed it to be done to you. It didn't matter whether you prayed for 20 hours a day. Let me shake your theology. It didn't matter whether the centurion went and fed the poor. It's all good to feed the poor. We've been feeding the poor for 23 years. But it does not determine how much of faith you got. It does not change the way God sees you. Do you understand? Your faith is not based on works. Your faith is based on revelation. And sometimes as Christians we think our faith is based on our works, on how we project ourselves to people. God is not moved of how you project yourself to people. God is moved by what's going on in your heart. There were disciples here that everyone saw them, the great guns walking with Jesus. Peter will probably be there. You know, Peter, he strikes me as this guy that will be bouncing around Jesus. Everyone thought, these are the 12 disciples, you can't touch them. Sometimes you come to church and you, you find Patsy worshipping here, you find Inesco playing his guitar, losing it under the glory of God. And you say, but these are, these, are super, these are super servants of God. They can have the faith. I can't have great faith. Wrong. It is not biblical. The disciples were with Jesus, but they did not have great faith. They actually were not at the cross when Jesus was there. They were the ones that saw the miracles. They were the ones that were actively involved, giving out, feeding the poor. But they did not have the great faith of the centurion. So what I'm saying today, my brother and sister, you'll be sitting in this church. Do not think that you are not worthy of great faith. You do not need to serve in God's house to have great faith. You can just be a normal person. No one knows your name in this church. You just come quietly. The giants are the silent ones. You just come quietly in church and you just sit down. You are the one that can move with great faith. Just one moment of faith and you can move the hand of God. Like the centurion. He never knew this God. Just that one day, he, something happened in his heart. And in that moment, he believed this God without a shadow of a doubt. That is great faith. When you are in that moment of desperation, when you are in that moment of either life or death, in that moment, 
you can create great faith in your life. And that faith will move the hand of God. It didn't matter whether you fed the poor. It didn't matter whether you gave a thousand dollars in the church for offering or tithes. It didn't matter whether you can pray or you can worship. It comes down to that moment if you will believe God with all of your heart and all of your soul and you will never doubt Him. In that moment you can change your destiny. That is great faith. Another mention of great faith, we look in, we go further in the book of Matthew, chapter 15. And once again, it is not about the disciples. No way God used the term great faith to show the disciple. So your, your servitude in the church, your gift that God has given you, does not show great faith in the eyes of God. That's what I have come to learn. That's why I'm a humble man before God. That's why I do not put myself on a pedestal. Because I've come to realize that the gift that God has given me to preach, to prophesy, to heal the sick, does not count for great faith in the eyes of God. Because He has given you that gift. It means nothing to God. When God sees your worship in here, when God sees me preaching, when God sees you praying for the sick, He's just saying, oh, well done. I see my, 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 uh, my gift in you is working. It means nothing. It doesn't show that you believe God. What shows that you believe God is when you stand before your Goliath and you say, as for me, I come to you in the name of my God. There is no gift in that. There is no supernatural ability. It's just pure faith. Amen. That is great faith. Amen. Like Angus Buckham said, faith must be like a potato. You must be able to feel it and see it and hold it. It's got nothing to do with what God has called you to do. It's got everything to do with how you see God. Yeah. That's why you have men and women of God. People that are used mightily with God. But they have no faith in God's provision. They have no faith in God's healing. Because they think their faith is about their gift. The faith is not about gift. The faith is about who you see God to be. Your faith is based on this. My Bible says that faith cometh from the gifts of God. No. It says in the book of Romans, faith cometh from hearing. And you're in the word of God. Simple. And then we need another time. Let's go quickly to the book of Matthew. Chapter 15. And I'm reading from verse 23. Now we come to the Gentile woman. These are the people that God used the word great faith to, to, uh, to show them off. Listen to this. This woman came to Jesus shouting all over. Jesus, Jesus, Son of God, help me, like blind Bartimaeus. And the disciples told him, Jesus, can't you listen to this woman? Just sort out, and this is where he picks up from. Verse 33, then the disciples said to him, where could we get, that's a wrong scripture. I'm on, tw I'm on 33, sorry. And there is uh, 23, and his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after her. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And the woman said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs that fell from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your fate. Let it be to you as you have desired. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. My brother and sister, your act of faith that moves the hand of God does not mean that you must be the chosen of God. This woman was a cast out person. She was a Gentile. Jesus himself said, I have not come for the Gentile. 
Don't you sit in this church this morning and say, Lord, this is not for me. This is for all those holy people in church that are raising their hands and, and they can pray and they can they can wander and Kawasaki and they can run and scream like Pastor Rakesh on the stage. This is not for me. I'm not worthy of it. You are worthy of it. If you will only trust this God, if you will only believe Him, He's not cared what you can do. He's not cared where you come from. He's not cared whether, even if you had a cigarette outside this church, we all have fallen short of the glory of God. All it will take is, Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me for the sins that I have done. But today, Lord, in this situation, I come to you with pure, innocent faith. Hallelujah. And I want to trust you, God. Lord, come and touch me. If faith was about our spirituality, there was no such thing as salvation. Because salvation is an act of faith. You must believe God to come to Him. You must believe that He is. The Bible says that those who believe, the salvation prayer says that if you believe that God is the Son, that Jesus is the Son of God, and if you believe that God rose Him from the dead, then you shall be saved. It had nothing to do with who you are, where you come from, what you own. In that moment of salvation, it was about your faith in God. Where you said, God, I believe you right now. It had nothing to do with your positions. Now let's move on. Do you all get that? And the strange thing is that these both occurrences where God explained great faith, it was not his disciples. It was not the church. It was Gentiles. It was people that didn't feel part of the church. Great things can happen to those that believe. Great things. Now what I learned from these things. The secret of great faith is what Jesus saw. Jesus saw great faith in the centurion. Jesus saw great faith in the Gentile woman. But what action did the centurion and the Gentile woman do to provoke that sight in Jesus' life? It was a simple childlike faith. All he did was, Lord, you don't even need to come to my house. You just speak a word and it will happen. The woman said, even the dogs can eat the crumbs of the table. It was just simple things. They didn't use scripture. They didn't quote the scriptures for Jesus. They didn't say, Lord, the Bible says, if I call upon the name of Jesus, it shall be done. In the name of Jesus, I call. No, not all that spiritual things. They just said, Lord, I believe you. I have faith in me that the situation that I have have no power before you. And God said, wow, I have found great faith. Let me come and invade your situation. And his servant was healed. The, the Gentile woman got the attention of God through her child like faith. Innocence. And God said, because of this, I'm going to come and invade your life. You will not move the hand of God with your gifts. With your ability to preach, you will move the hand of God when you believe Him as a child believes Him. When you take off your titles and you take off all the things that make you important in the circular world, when you take those things off and come to Jesus, because the kingdom of God belongs to the children. When they brought the children to Jesus, and the disciples came and said, Hey, kids, you all just move away. This is for adults here. And Jesus said, Hey, the kingdom of God belongs to them. Amen. And many times in the Christian environment, we push, around, we push aside the less, those that don't portray spirituality. And we say, Oh, you're not allowed in this 
atmosphere. I need people to sit in this front row, please, next week. I'm very lonely here in the front. Why don't you come sit in the front? What's wrong with you? Do you think you're not spiritual enough? You don't have enough faith to sit in the front? I'm a sinner. I'm the worst sinner of all. We all are saved by grace. Please come and sit. Just leave three chairs for my wife and I want for a bed. And please come and fill the front row. I'm very lonely here. Yeah? Because we put ourselves in this situation. Oh, there's Andre. Sit next to Andre here. Yeah? Let him, let him infuse you with the, with the spirit of intercession. No, I can't sit here with Andre because I'm not, I'm not an intercessor. Andre is the prayer warrior. Come and sit with him. We put ourselves in these places. We say that we are not spirit. We cannot exercise great faith. This is not for us. This is for them. That's what they did. We are like children. And what God said, those that you say that are not qualified for the grace of God, it is theirs to command. Those people that sit at the back, that feel like, you, oh, I'm not, I can't sit in the front of the church. Exercise that great faith and God will touch you. God will change everything. So what I learned from this quickly is that great faith is not what you do. Great faith is what God sees in you. What you do is childlike faith. Your childlike faith is perceived as great faith in God's eyes, not in man's eyes. But we are moved by what man sees. And we think that great faith is acting spiritual because man will see me as great faith. Oh, when I, before I pray, and I'm not speaking of anyone, but call someone to pray. Why do we pray in tongues first? Why? Because we assume. I used to do that when Pastor Jeff called me to pray. And I'm not speaking about anyone. You just carry on enjoying your spirituality. But we feel that if we pray in tongues, we evoke spirituality upon ourselves. And that spirituality is going to move the hand of God. Uh -uh. My Bible says praying in tongues edifies you and you speak mysteries, nothing else. It doesn't qualify you as spiritual. What qualifies you to move the hand of God is childlike faith. In the eyes of God, that childlike faith, just simple, Lord, you are my God, I believe you, will move the hand of heaven and it will change your destiny. Because God sees it as great faith. When the Bible speaks of great faith, it's actually speaking of a childlike faith action from you. So don't disqualify yourself. When we think of great faith, we think, oh, spiritual, not for me yet. Uh -uh. Childlike faith. Amen. Does that make sense to you? I've never seen that before. God showed me this morning when I was praying. He says, go tell my people about childlike faith. Then I say, oh, praise the Lord. Let me talk about, Lord, give me a scripture. He gives me these two scriptures. I open it to talk of great faith. I say, Lord, what's going on here? He tells me talk of childlike faith. And he sends me to scriptures that talk about great faith. And he says it's the same thing. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's move on. This is what Peter says in the book of Peter, 1 Peter. Chapter 5, verse 5, it says that God resists the proud and He exalts the humble. Amen. He exalts those that have childlike faith, not those that think that they are spiritual. If you want to move mountains for God, you have to be like a David before God. You have to be humble before God. You have to just take God by His word and say, Lord, I don't know how you're going to do it, but your word says so. It has nothing to do with what you do. It has nothing to do with your spiritual standing with God. At that moment, you need to believe God and it will change your destiny forever. Amen. When David stood before the, uh, his people, when the presence of God was coming, he was the king of Israel. He was supposed to be, oh, praise.
of the Lord, the King, you know. And the Bible tells me of a different story. And it says that David danced before the Lord. He took his cloak and he put it, he tied it up, and he danced before the presence of God. He had childlike feet. That's what caused David to slay Goliath. That's what caused him to overcome the lion and the bear. That's what caused him to slay every enemy that stood before him. That's what caused David to become the greatest king in all the history of Israel. The kingdom that would never fall. Not because he was a super spiritual person. David fell many times. But when he came to God, he did not come as the king of Israel. This is the secret, my brother and my sister. In worship, there are no ranks. In praise, there are no positions. When we come in this church, we come as sons and daughters of God. We don't come as business owners. This is where we lose it. If you walk into the sanctuary of God as a boss, as a manager, as a CEO of a company, you cannot bow before this God. When you come to worship God, you come as a son and a daughter of God. Your crown is at that door. You can pick it up on your way out. You can pick up your title on your way out. Right here, there is no rights in worship. When you come to Jesus, there is no rights. When he sees you, all he sees is whether you have faith or you don't have faith. He's not cared whether you own a thousand cars or a hundred houses. It means nothing to Jesus. My Bible says all the cattle of a thousand hills belong to him. All the gold and all the silver in this world belong to this God. All he wants is faith from you. And David danced before the Lord as the king of Israel. When the presence of God comes, my brother and sister, your titles mean nothing. Those titles that you have is given to you by God. How then can you come with that title before the God that has given it to you? Then he is not Jehovah Jireh to you. Then he is not the God Almighty to you. Then you are your God. And this is what David was saying. I am the king of Israel. I command the greatest army in the world. But when the presence of God comes, I am just a little shepherd boy saved by grace. I can have, I've got employees in different countries, in different cities. I can pick up the phone and tell this one do this and this one do that. But when I come into this house, I am just that drug addict that was saved by grace. I was just this man that was lost in this world, that was going nowhere. And now I have the honor to speak for the God of glory. Amen. That's how I worship him. Without that, you will never bow before this God. Your pride as a manager, as a CEO of a company will not allow you to bow to this God. You can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer. In this house, there is no titles. We are all sons and daughters of God. This is the secret of great faith in the eyes of God. On your side, it is childlike faith that comes to God. And David danced before Jesus. The glory of God, his wife came and his wife made a comment and she said, Oh, the king of Israel, the king of Israel has made himself so low before the people. He undignified dance before his maid servants. What she was saying is, they will not respect you any longer. But in the presence of God, it's not about man, it's about him. You worship him not for the respect of man. My brother and sister, I still command the respect of all those that I lead. 
but I will still be a humble servant before my God. I will still cry before my God. I will still kneel before Him. I will still worship Him with all that I am. I want to tell you something. That worship, that childlike faith of David caused his men to follow him to death. He raised the most mightiest army that Israel has ever seen. His men were given life for him. When he told his men, go into the camp of Saul, they could have been killed, but they said, because you have told us, David, we will go. Your pride will not bring prosperity in your life. Your humility, your childlike faith before God will cause the hand of God to move you and cause you to possess things that will change your destiny forever. The problem is we want to bring our crowns into the kingdom of God. We want to bring our titles into the church. It will not allow you, that crown on your head will not allow you to bow before the king of glory. And David told his wife, I don't care what you are saying. I have a revelation of this God. You don't understand. My wife, I love you, but you don't understand. This God that you are telling me not to dance before is the God that gave me the throne of Israel. Once you get that revelation, there will be no crowns in your worship. There will be no managers here. There will be no CEOs. There will be no rich and poor. There will be no black and white in the house of God. There will only be sons and daughters of God worshipping the King of glory, the giver of all things. And the Bible said something. Because Michal did not see it in that line, she was barren all the days of her life. My brother and sister, you can come to church. You can worship God. You can do whatever you want with that crown on your head. But spiritually, you will be barren before the eyes of God. Your money cannot buy the grace of God. Your crown, your position, your, 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 your job that you do cannot buy the grace of God. Only childlike faith that says, Lord, I believe in you. And David led the greatest army that history has ever known. No nation could stand before him. And it had nothing to do with his mind, but with all the God of heaven that went before him and slain the nations that stood before him. We are busy fighting the devil because we still got our crowns on our head. Take that title off and bow before the King of Glory and He will fight that battle. My Bible says simple. It's all in the Word of God. My Bible says the battle is the Lord's. Amen. Simple. Are you getting something? Something different on, on faith. Amen. Amen. We thank God for revelation. Abraham left his father's house with childlike faith. Just say, here's my, my inheritance is all set. I'm a rich man, I've got everything set. And God spoke, and he just leaves everything and he walks by faith. Childlike faith. Abraham didn't Honda and Kawasaki. He didn't fast, he didn't go to the mountain and pray for 40 days. He just obeyed God. Just obey God. Just obey his word. If he says forgive, forgive. If he says trust me, trust him. He will meet that faith. Because it was a simple faith that Abraham left his father's house in the voice of God. But when God looked down upon Abraham, he said, Wow, such great faith I have never seen. Not even in Adam I saw this kind of faith. I'm going to bless you. And then God goes before Abraham into Canaan and he finds turmoil and he finds famine. And God says, that faith that you have has provoked me to come here and bless this land and everything. Wherever your foot will tread, I will bless. I will make you more prosperous than the kings of this land. 
because you trusted me. Not because of your bloodline. Not because of your mother and your father. Not because that you came and prayed for 40 days on the mountain. No, because you trusted me. Amen. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. And in all the ways acknowledge it. And he will direct your path. It speaks of childlike faith. All over the Bible it's speaking of childlike faith. It's not saying that you need to know. When you trust God with all of your heart that my children. To them I'm a plumber. To them I'm an electrician. I'm a pool technician. I'm a mechanic. To my wife I'm even a carpenter. An aircon technician. A alarm technician. I must do everything because they have childlike faith in the man of the house. My children believe in me with all of their heart that I can do anything that they ask me to do because they got childlike faith in their father and your father in heaven the same. Can you not have childlike faith in me, the creator of all the heavens? They have childlike faith in a man that has many sons. I'm asking you this morning to have childlike faith in the God of heaven, the creator of all things, the giver of life. How much more easier is that? And then God will look down upon you and say, Wow, I have seen such great faith in your life. Hallelujah. Amen. One more scripture I want to take you to. Let's go to the book of Revelations. Go to the book of Revelations, chapter 4. Just quickly so I can give you some um, a background on this. I, I, I preached on this a few times so you all should know it. Um, the, uh, when, when John had a vision of heaven, he had a picture of the throne room of God. And this is the picture that he paints, that we're going to be worshipping. Um, verse 1, the fourth chapter of Revelation. After these things I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne set in heaven. And one sat on the throne, and he who sat there was like Jasper and Sardine, Sardis, whatever, stone, some precious stone, in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and, the, and on the throne sat twenty-four elders, sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their head. Are you seeing these things? This is what we're going to see. Do you have faith in that? Imagine these elders. Imagine their position in heaven. Imagine who they are to sit right there around the throne of the God of glory. They had white robes. They had crowns of gold. They were CEOs of Lucha Company. These were the Leon Mars of the day in heaven. They were the big shots that commanded everything under the command of God. Are you getting this picture? Yeah. They were not just normal people in heaven. These were the big shots. Why were they the big shots in heaven? I'm going to show you right now. Let's jump down to verse 8. And the four living creatures, each having six wings, full of eyes around them within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, Holy, Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him. Who sits on the throne and worships him, who lives forever and ever, and casts their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, 
to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and we and were created these big shots in heaven when the glory of God comes this is what John saw in heaven these big shots with their white clothes with their big crowns of gold they put aside their crowns and they bow before the God of glory. Why? Because they realize that those crowns that they wear on their head was given to them by the King of glory. The proud shall be resisted and the humble shall be exalted in the kingdom of God. These are the ways of the Spirit. If you will recognize that that job that you have that position that you have of authority has been given to you by God. You will not allow that position to enter the house of the God that has given it to you. If you are wearing your position in God's house, means that you believe that it is yours. But if you believe that God has given you that position, you will be too afraid to bring it into His house. I can put someone in a position and if that manager comes to me and tries to exercise their authority over me, they will be trouble. That's not how it works. The receiver cannot command the giver. We are the receivers. And when you find your place in the kingdom of God, great things shall be yours. So when we worship in this house, doctors, lawyers, CEOs of the biggest companies will come and bow at this altar as one man and one woman for the King of Glory. At this altar, there is no CEOs, there are no pastors, there are no prophets and apostles that are greater than anyone. Here, there is only sons and daughters of God. When I come to this God, I come to Him as a son, not as an apostle. When I stand before His people, I stand in my office. Are you all getting something? This is what great faith is about. It's not about your great acts. It's about your humility to believe God. And have childlike faith. Thank you guys. Have childlike faith to possess great things. And when we come to this place, then there shall be unity in the house of God. Then people will no longer put on a smoke screen and think that they are holier than everyone else. In the eyes of God, we are all equal. One day we will stand in heaven, my brother, my sister, my brother sitting there at the back of the church. One day we will stand in heaven and we will stand before this world that is sitting on his throne. And when he sees us, he will not see a man that just came and joined the church and there's the pastor in the front that everyone listens to. In that day, we will stand equal before this God. Are you listening to what I'm saying? I am here because of what God gave me. It is not because I am better than you. God gave me the grace to stand here. And without that grace, I cannot do this. So it does not make me better than you in the eyes of God. In the eyes of God, we are all created in His image, in His likeness. And that's how He sees us. All our gifts and all our talents that God has given us does not separate us in the eyes of God. We have separated ourselves before man. And we have put hierarchy before man. The things of the spirit 
We do not follow the program of man. If you want to do great things for God, become a child before God and take Him. If His word said so, take Him. Sometimes I look at sophisticated men of God. I even try to ask them how they are. Because they ask me and I say, hey bro, I'm like a man. Ask me, man, I'm blessed and anointed and called of God. And then I look, oh my God, I'm excellent. <laughs> Why I'm not talking like that? In the eyes of God, we are just a man and a woman. Say my place, my brother and sister. Eranunda Karasho Kele Ronongo. Renenda Rokando Rasute de Rondo Kandan. All those things that you are doing is because God gave you the ability to do it. And He gave you that ability so that you can worship Him and lead His people to Him. Not so that you can stand above any other person. We all will stand one day before this God and in that day your gift will not stand before you. Your houses and your cars that separate you in this world will not speak for you. It has no voice in the glory of God. Your positions have no authority in the throne room of God. Your million rands in your bank account have no voice in the throne of Israel. When you sweat, he's sitting on his throne and you stand before him. And all of us will stand before him. In that day, we are all equal before this God. This is great faith before God. Before man, it will be childlike faith. Where you tell me to go, Lord, I will go. Let's sing that song. <coughs> Listen to the song. We sing it all the time. Where you tell me to go, Lord, I will go. Where you, what you tell me to be, I will be. I'm a child. When I tell my daughters to do this and do that, I do not need to explain. Maybe now they think that they are hitting 18 and becoming young women that I need to explain. I do not need to explain. God does not need to explain when He commands you. This Bible does not need to be justified. Do you understand that, my brother and sister? This Bible does not need to be justified. It is the voice of God. That is childlike faith. I want to see giants. I want to see men and women that thought that you are nothing, that you are not spiritual. I want you to move the hand of God this week. I want you to call upon this God. I want you to see the miracles of heaven in your life. You will move God by your heart, by your feet. Young people, God will listen to you. God will speak to you. If you will trust Him, just where you are, just believe Him. Believe this God with all of your heart and all of your soul. And lean not on your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge Him. And He will direct your path. And when He directs your path, He will guide you into all righteousness. Hallelujah. Let's worship the Lord. Come. If you need prayer, I want you to come to the front. We're going to worship God. We're going to bless the name of the God of heaven. Hallelujah. Thank you. 
this house. There are no crowns. So you can come, Lord. And you can abide in this house. As your sons and daughters worship you. All we want is you, Lord. May our life portray great faith in your life. In your eyes, Lord. Not see the failure that this world sees, but may you see our heart. May you see the great thing that abides within us. Teach us, Holy Spirit, to walk the path that we need to walk in Jesus' mighty name. Bless each and every person. May the burning fire of the Holy Spirit be with them. Take them safely and bring them back safely. of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all the days of